Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Steve Ross with the Artists and Athletes Alliance, and on, beha <laughs> and on behalf of Cut 50 in UCLA, I'd like to welcome you to our briefing on criminal justice reform. It's great. It's great to see so many friends here and, and artists and athletes, uh, supporters and members of our board. It's great to see a whole bunch of new faces. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the Artists and Athletes Alliance, we're a nonprofit, educational, and charitable organization that sits at the nexus between the entertainment and creative community and the decision makers, policy makers, and opinion leaders in DC. We, our mission is to educate on public policy and the important issues facing our nation. Uh, we want to get everybody who we talk with and we work with up to speed on the issues that they're passionate about. We want them to be smarter on the issues so they could use their voices to help the causes and become advocates on the issues that they're passionate about. So for those of you that aren't familiar with artists and athletes, if you're interested in learning more, come see me after, check out our website. But uh, we're trying to make a difference and it's been an honor working with Cut 50 uh, in the past and we're honored for you guys to be here tonight. So thank you. <laughs> During tonight's event, uh, we, you'll see have uh, note cards on each of the chairs. You're probably all sitting on them or throwing them on the floor. <laughs> but if you have a question to keep, uh, give us the time to really push through. If you have a question, write, write it down on the card, hold it up, and we'll have a runner from UCLA uh, picking them up, and we'll get them to the moderator. We want to make sure we take care of your questions, but we have a lot of stuff to talk to you about tonight. So we're looking forward to hearing from you and uh, answering as many questions as you can. OK. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our moderator from UCLA, Alicia Varani. <laughs> Alicia is the Associate Director of Criminal Justice Programs at UCLA School of Law. And now I'm old, I gotta put on my glasses. <laughs> Her areas of research and advocacy include pretrial reform, restorative justice, and the democratization of legal knowledge to individuals caught up in the criminal and juvenile legal systems. Currently, Alicia teaches bail clinic where students represent people charged with felonies in their bail hearings to argue for their release. Prior to UCLA, Alicia spearheaded a restorative justice initiatives program for the California Conference for Equality and Justice. She's been a public defender in Orange County, representing thousands of people in criminal cases. Ladies and gentlemen, Alicia Varani. I'm now gonna introduce a man who doesn't need much introduction, so I'll keep that real short. Co-founder of Cut50, founding CEO of Reform Alliance, host of not one, but two shows on CNN, The Van Jones Show and The Redemption Project. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Van Jones. <laughs> Van, if you want to introduce yeah. your group. Great. Um, well, first, I just want to say uh, it's really extraordinary to see a room, a room this big uh, on this issue. Uh, I spent 25 years of my life working on trying to close prisons, trying to get people home. Uh, we're in the homecoming business. And it was very, very tough for a very long time. And both Democrats and Republicans bought into the lie that you could punish people and hurt people and that that would somehow make our community safer and it didn't work. And to see now people beginning to come around is extraordinary and we're proving that if you fight you win this is one of the few moments in this whole nightmare that we're going through you're going to leave here inspired because we're actually beginning to win and the reason yeah we're actually beginning to win um, so um, you know one of the reasons one of the reasons for that is because of Steve uh, the relationship that we have uh, with this organization. Um, a lot of people want to make a difference. A lot of people of influence want to make a difference. A lot of people who are 
athletes, a lot of people who are entertainers, a lot of people who are producers, a lot of people who are agents want to make a difference. It's hard to make a difference. Uh, but because of the work that Steve does, being that bridge between the lawmakers and the influencers, uh, he is a, a force multiplier and the organization, Artists and Athletes, is a force multiplier for us. And you're going to hear that a lot of people in this room came through. Uh, when we were in the war of our lives last year to try to get a bipartisan criminal justice bill through and signed, a lot of people in this room came through, came to Washington, D.C., walked halls, did stuff that they you know, got beat up for in the press, uh, and yet now there are people who are free. Uh, we had uh, 2,100 people who went free out of federal prisons on Friday alone because of this fight. And we're just getting started. And we're just, and we're just getting started. So another reason, another reason that we're able to talk about victories is because of two people sitting to my left. Um, you know, Jessica Jackson uh, is, was the main architect and general uh, leading us into battle to pass the First Step Act. Uh, she's an extraordinary uh, advocate. I think she's probably the most persuasive uh, advocate that I've ever worked with, and I've worked with people for 25 years. Uh, she comes by this work honestly uh, because of something that happened in her family, uh, a loved one who went away to prison. Uh, and they messed with the wrong sister because <laughs> uh, she <laughs> is like, it's like the revenge of the, of the legally blonde. I mean, she just, <laughs> she said, that's enough. <laughs> and um, so uh, she's done extraordinary work as a leader of Cut 50. And then also Lewis Reed uh, sitting next to her, uh, who, uh, yeah. Um, uh, obviously, one of the most beloved people in this movement, uh, did 14 years in federal prison, uh, came out, and has been a healing force uh, is, a, is a licensed uh, clinician, is a healer, uh, but also is a fighter and helps to lead a nationwide network called the Empathy Network, where Republicans and, yes, <laughs> Republicans and Democrats get a chance to work together arm in arm going into the halls of state legislatures, getting lawmakers to sit down and hear the real stories of what's going on. And it's white, black, and brown, it's red and blue, and it's powerful and they pass many, many bills. And so, uh, look, I, I get a lot of attention and I get a lot of credit I don't deserve, which I'm happy to have because I have low self-esteem. It's good for <laughs> <laughs> keep this why well, I love it. Please don't, don't back off of it. Um, but <laughs> um, but uh, I'm really proud to be a part of, of an organization, of a team, and that team has cut 50. So please give them a round of applause. So I'm only going to speak really briefly because I know you all came here to listen to these three amazingly brilliant humans doing wonderful work in this field of criminal justice. But I just wanted to lay a foundation and set the groundwork for what we're really talking about here. So as I speak right now, there are 2.3 million people sitting in jails and prisons around this country. An additional 4.5 million people are under correctional control in this country. There's no question today that the carceral system is a continuation of slavery and a tool to maintain the racial caste system of this country. Black people make up 40% of the incarcerated population while being only 13% of US residents. As a society, we have become dependent on incarceration and punishment. Jails and prisons are used to put away poor people, LGBTQ people, people of color, people who are HIV positive, and people with substance abuse issues and mental health issues. And let's bring it home here to Los Angeles County, where 70% of people held in our jails here are mentally ill or medically ill. So with us today are three individuals who are fighting against these injustices. And I'm so honored to be here to also hear them talk about healing as a part of this movement, because I think that is so incredibly important when we talk about historical trauma and generations of people who this criminal legal system has impacted. Cut 50 is fighting alongside those most impacted to ensure that they are seen as human beings to be treated with dignity and respect who are fighting to remind us all that transformation is possible, that we can win. This weekend alone, as Van mentioned, 2,200 incarcerated people returned to their families and communities. 
And this, I believe, was the first thing that Cut50 did, was pass the First Step Act. So if this is their first thing, I can only imagine what amazing, phenomenal things that they are going to do. Their goal is to cr cut the prison population in half and crime in half, and something tells me that you will not stop even when that goal is reached. Um, so we're ever so lucky to get to hear from them today and to have this discussion with these panelists. So I'm going to warm up the panel by asking you a rapid fire question. Um, what is one thing in, that people in this room should know about our criminal legal system and its impacts that they might not know? And I'll start with Lewis and then I'll go this way. Sure. Uh, so I think that people should know that the most powerful person in the room, in the courtroom I should say, is not the judge. The most powerful person in the courtroom is the prosecutor. The prosecutor controls the charges while the judge controls the actual sentence. So that's my vantage point. Um, I think people in this room should know that the issue of mass incarceration is much more than just the 2.3 million who are incarcerated or the 4.6 who are on correctional supervision. A recent study actually showed that one out of every two adults has a loved one who's in prison. This is an issue that's costing hundreds of billions of dollars a year that could be going into our schools, that could be going into our neighborhoods, that could be actually addressing issues like mental health and addiction um, and, and preventing crime. So this is an issue that impacts all of us, some of us very closely. Um, two things, one is that 2.3 million number that means nothing to most people. Let me put it in perspective. 2.3 million people locked up is the biggest prison population in the history of the world. There has never been a country in the history of the world with 2.3 million people locked up. And if we win and we cut it in half and you only have you know, 1.2 or 1.1, it's still the biggest prison population in the history of the world. That's how over incarcerated we are. China has a billion people. We only have 300 million. China with a billion people has a million people locked up. We could cut our prison population in half and still have more people locked up than China. The other thing is with that 4.3 million uh, who are caught up on probation and parole, that group of people twice as many people uh, can go back to prison at any point for not committing a crime. Mm -hmm. A nun could not survive on probation or parole because you can go back to prison for being 10 minutes late to a meeting with your probation officer. You can go back to prison for going to the neighborhood, one neighborhood over to check on your aunt who just had a stroke if that's not the right neighborhood for you to be in. You can go back to prison for not committing crimes. What does that mean? That means when you came home from prison, it was hard to get a job, it was hard to get an apartment, hard to get your kids back out of foster care. You did all those things. You're 10 minutes late for a meeting. You go back to prison for three months. You lose your job. You lose your apartment. You lose your kids back in a foster care, and you have to start all over again. So, Mass supervision, twice as many people as mass incarceration. So this is a massive, massive problem. Uh, there, there are more people, there are more black people, more African Americans who are incarcerated right now than were ever enslaved at any one point in time in the, the, during the enslavement. So it's a massive, massive problem. I just want those numbers to have, have a little bit more shock value for you so you understand why we're saying we want to cut it in half at least and go beyond that. Yeah, thank you for painting that picture for us. I do think that numbers sometimes become very abstract. Um, with the scope of the problem being so large, as you all just touched upon, and with power resting in so few hands around this, um, Jessica, can you talk to us about what was the impetus and sort of the historical trajectory of the First Step Act, and what were, in a nutshell, the major reforms that got passed with the Act? Yeah, so the First Step Act, even though it was passed last year and signed into law on December 21st, um, Van and I had the honor of being there when it was signed into law, 
Um, it really started many years before. So nowadays you hear bipartisan criminal justice reform and everybody kind of nods their head like, okay, yeah, sure. But really when Cut 50 got started um, back in January 2015, we hosted a bipartisan summit on criminal justice reform. People thought we were crazy. Like, we had Van Jones and Newt Gingrich and Donna Brazile and <laughs> Pat Nolan from the American Conservative Union and 80 other speakers ranging from Eric Holder to like Grover Norquist up on stage together. And I remember if you closed your eyes, which I, I did a bunch because I had a six week old <laughs> baby upstairs in the hotel. Um, but if you closed your eyes, you really couldn't tell who was a Democrat and who was a Republican talking. And that's because there had been a lot of groundwork laid uh, to get to the point that we were at that created the grounds for the First Step Act. Um, back in 2013, there was a bill, the Smarter Corrections Act, where both Republicans who felt like, you know, this is an overbloated system that lacks transparency, costs billions of dollars, um, and takes away liberty for no reason, they were starting to get involved and upset. You had Democrats, of course, coming to this, saying, look at all, all the intelligence behind the bars that we're wasting. Look at the communities that we're breaking. Um, so they'd really laid the ground for the First Step Act. Now, last year, um, the First Step Act was you know, built on bills that had come before it and not passed. Um, but the main provisions we were able to get in there is we were able to address what prisons, federal prisons do. For a long time, federal prisons have just been places of punishment um, and, and places to get retribution, right? I saw a senator uh, from Louisiana on Tucker Carlson last night and um, I see heads shaking, no, yeah, no, I agree <laughs> with you, I'm 100% with you. Um, but I saw him last night talking about how justice meant, uh, meant retribution. It meant getting what you deserve. And I kept thinking to myself, like, that's not justice, right? Our justice system should be about rehabilitating people and redemption and second chances. And that's really what the First Step Act does. It creates programming inside of the prisons uh, so that people can get the life-changing classes they need, they can get that help for their drug addiction, they can get that education that they need to get, um, they can you know, start to think about victim-offender dialogue and what does that look like? What does it look like to really take accountability for your actions? Um, and they can actually get time off their sentence for taking this programming. Uh, we changed the conditions of prisons I, I bet there are people in this room who will be shocked to know that before the First Step Act, it was legal in a federal prison to shackle a woman who was delivering a baby, right? That's shocking that in 2018, we had to make it illegal for a woman to be shackled in a federal prison. And there are still state prisons who do it. Um, so we started to address some of the conditions of confinement so that we can start treating people with fairness and then we focused on, uh, with dignity, and then we focused on fairness as well. We started to address some of the sentencing reforms. Now, it's called the First Step Act for a reason. It was a first step, uh, but it was a monumental step in the right direction. And there was some sentencing reforms that changed the way people are gonna be sentenced to prison. We have a whole lot more work to do, and, and that's gonna be the second step. And Van, you talked about how this is a moment in which we can win, and you saw that win in the First Step Act and many other movements that you've been involved in around criminal justice. What do you think is happening right now that is sort of getting everything into place to allow these wins to happen? And what is the work that has come to actually be able to make this happen? I'm gonna tell y'all the real, okay? Uh, we all friends That's here. That's what we're here so for. So look, <laughs> I'm gonna tell y'all what, what really happened. She's trying to sound more professional, and I appreciate that. But um, first of all, we was terrified because Trump won. So everything that we have been doing, carefully pulling stuff together, and Jessica was really the architect of this. Working with Newt Gingrich's team. Uh, Newt and I had a TV show together called Crossfire, and so that's how, Newt, how, how Jessica got access to Newt's whole team, took over his whole team. 
<laughs> she would get up at like six o'clock in the morning on the West Coast and boss them all day on the East Coast <laughs> and make them do stuff under the Obama administration. And just doing stuff that was you know, probably illegal. I don't even know if it's right. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even know if you could do that. Um, but uh, she was able to get all of these conservative you know, people, because uh, you know, her mom is like a Swedish socialist and her dad's like a Trump supporting like Georgia dude. So she's like a weird, <laughs> she's she like mixed. So different kind of mixed. And um, so we had lined up all of these Republicans to try to help Obama get something positive done. And we were about to get it done under Obama. And we were so close. And then our orange friend <laughs> launches his bid. And he's not saying nothing that we had been talking about or that any Republican had been talking about. Because Republicans had been doing better. You know, Rick Perry closed eight prisons in Texas. and. Deal had cut the prison. So we had Republicans finally moving the right way, and then Trump ran. And when Trump ran, he was all the way wrong. And it froze the process. It froze the Republicans in place. And then the Democrats said, well, we're just going to wait for Hillary anyway, and we'll, we'll, you know, it's going to be a blowout for Hillary. And so everything we worked for just got totally demolished when Trump came in, and he gives a speech about American carnage. When Trump gets elected, private prison stocks go through the roof. It's just all bad. And we were terrified that we were going to go 20 years backwards on this. And a miracle happened. When the Obamas left and the Trumps went in, Trump brought all our people with him. So we lost no access. So we literally had people on the inside of that building. And those people were still down. And they wanted to do something positive. But they had to deal with their boss. And so, you know, Jessica started this whole very delicate process of helping the people in that building begin to move the president. And you can move a president. You know, I used to work for Obama. You can move a president, but it's very, very careful, and it's very, very tough. And you know, uh, Kim Kardashian got engaged. Uh, Jared Kushner's father had gone to prison. Nobody really knew that, but we found that out. So we were able to deal with him on that basis. This stuff comes down to very human stuff. And it turned out there was a faction fight going on inside of that building, and there were some people who wanted to go the negative way, some people wanted to go the positive way. And we felt like we couldn't be neutral in a faction fight inside that White House. And so we were able to get Trump to take some baby steps, releasing some people, and then endorsing a small bill, and then endorsing a big bill. And ultimately, we were able to get to, to win. And what I'll say about that is last year was hard. Um, I've never been called so many Uncle Toms. I've never been called so many sellouts. I've never been called so many names by people who are my people. Uh, and we had to look in the mirror in a real way. Um, you know, what is this about? The people in prison didn't lose the election. If you're in prison, you can't vote. So if we're going to fight like hell when Obama is there, and put all, everything on the line for when Obama is there. But then when we, when we don't like the person who's in there now, we do nothing to help people. Maybe we didn't care about people in the first place. Maybe it was just about ego. Maybe it was just about career. What, what is this really about? And I've never met anybody in prison who told me, I'm in prison. I'm being brutalized. I miss my family. I want to go home. Please help me. But whatever you do, don't talk to any Republicans. I've never, ha I've never heard that. And so we had one, I'm just be honest, uh, we had, what, 100 civil rights and civil liberties organizations oppose the First Step Act in the House. 160. 160. <laughs> Opposed us in the House because they said the bill was too small in the House, and it was. And quietly, they didn't want Trump to have a victory. And our view was, let's get something through the House and then get to the Senate and make it better but don't kill us in the house. 
um, we had to go against all of our friends. Well, Brian Stevenson was with us, but we had to go against the Washington Post, the ACLU, the NAACP, John Lewis, my heroes, my legends, my mentors, but we weren't going to let yet another U.S. president fail to do something for this population. And we won in the House on the first vote with 380? 358? 358. 59, yeah. yeah three, so we won in the House because and we had 100% of Democratic leadership with us. Um, and then we went over to the Senate and we went over there 87 to 12. It would have been 88 to 12 if Lindsey Graham had gotten off the plane in time. Uh, so, and then we went into the, into the Trump White House and the Trump Oval Office. I'm standing here, Trump is right, well, I'm here, Trump is there, and Jessica's right on the other side of the desk. And when he signs the bill, he handed me the pen. And that was December 21st. The next day, the government shut down. Longest shut down in US history. What does that mean? That means this issue, which everybody said was a lost cause. Everybody said you couldn't get anything done. Everybody said it was impossible, which the liberal establishment tried to stop and the right wing establishment tried to stop. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, because we wouldn't give up and because formerly incarcerated people didn't have, they didn't know the system. So they didn't know, they didn't know we had lost. We got beat 27 times, this bill was dead. They didn't know, they kept fighting and bringing it back and bringing it back and bringing it back. And so at the end of the day, on December 21st, America's government couldn't even agree to keep itself open, but agreed to criminal justice reform. And so that's where we are now. That's where we are now. So it sounds like, um, yeah. so it's, it's really, sounds like what you're talking about is work that's really being driven by the people most impacted by this work and putting their voices and their pain first. And so, Lewis, I wanted to turn to you to ask you about those people who the First Step Act and Cut 50's work more broadly is impacting, and if you can talk to us about the real lives that your work is changing. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the things that I always remind people of is that the First Step Act was not passed and it was not fueled by the, the historical template that you would usually use in order to pass a bill. We didn't have a big treasure chest of money. All we had was ingenuity, blood, sweat, tears, a lot of fasting, a whole bunch of praying, and we just refused to give up. And the coalition was led by people such as myself people such as Topeka K. Sam, who is our Dignity Director, people such as David Safavian, people such as Sarita Stein Martin, people such as Ashley Carter, people who just, like Van discussed, we, we, we just didn't know that we were dead. <laughs> we had already been at the bottom. Think about it, when you are incarcerated, you, there's no place in life that you can go that's lower than that. You have your dignity stripped away from you. You have to stand up at a, 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 during an account. You are subject to strip, strip searches at any given time arbitrarily, et cetera. So we had already been at the bottom. And I remember one incident in, in particular. We had experienced one of those deaths that, that Van talked about. And I felt absolutely deflated. I felt defeated. And Van had pulled me aside and he was trying to talk to me about the politics. And he was saying, this is how politics works, and I need you to understand politics. And just as soon as he finished his sentence, Jessica pulled me to the other side. I still, still think I got whiplash. And she said, <laughs> she said, Lewis, she said, I don't want you to focus on politics. She said, as surprising as it is, <laughs> she said, I don't want you to focus on politics. She said, I want you to focus on people. She said, I want you to bring every single person by whom you have done federal prison time with into these rooms. She said, I want you to bring those more than 200 people that you are still in contact with who are in federal prisons into those rooms. She said, I want you to bring the families of those people who are ringing your phone day in and night out into those rooms. And she said, you are going to focus on telling a story, telling the story on what it's like about how not to be able to have access to your family member because that person is more than 500 miles away. And the family member has to make a decision as to whether or not they are going to send commissary to that person or if whether or not they're gonna fuel up the car to make it from Connecticut all the way to Colorado to spend four hours uh, on, on a visit. She said, that's what I want you to focus on. And it recalibrated me. And what it did was it allowed me to really 
keep my focus right where it needed to be, on the people. And the, it was the people, it was the people, it was the people who led this campaign. It was supported by the administration. It was supported by other coalition members that actually came on. But for the most part, one of the things that I love about Van Jones and one of the things that I love about Jessica Jackson is that they amplified and they invested into the leadership of people such as myself in order to get this uh, bill across the finish line. Lewis, earlier today we had the opportunity to talk to some students, um, undergraduate law students, and you were talking about the work that you're doing to help people when they're re-entering. So people who are getting released, based on some of what you had to deal with in your own experience, can you share now with this audience the work that you're doing to help people with the needs that they have when they're re-entering? Sure. So just some context. Uh, when I was first released, I remember what it was like for me to go to the Department of Motor Vehicle and to have to go through the bureaucracy just to, get a, just to get an identification card, not even a driver's license, just to get an identification card. I had no ID to present in order to get an ID, and yet they were telling me that I needed an ID. And it just, it just drove me literally up a wall. I went to uh, direct service providers. I'm from Connecticut. I'm from the largest city in Connecticut. I went to direct service providers, and I found that there were a lot of people who were working in silos. So what I did was um, I introduced a concept or a model to the largest city in the, in, in, in the state of Connecticut uh, to develop a reentry program based off of the conversations that I was having with people who were running up against those same frustrations and those same bureaucracies. We end up replicating that model throughout the state of Connecticut and also throughout several jurisdictions in our nation. How that translates to what we are doing now here at Cut 50 is those people who are being released under the First Step Act. What Jessica has asked me to do, and you know, many of our uh, uh, empathy organizers who are in the room, is essentially to tap into the people, the resources nationwide, the direct service people, people such as Don John Ponder, who is in Nevada, people such as Ashley uh, uh, Carter, who is here in Los Angeles. Tap into the resources of the people who are on the ground and make sure that those people are connecting the people who are are going to be released under the First Step Act with appropriate resources. What are, what are those resources? I'm glad that you asked. <laughs> do, do, That's your performance. <laughs> <laughs> those resources are having Lyft ride share credits, thanks to Kim Kardashian and, and, and the partnership that she created through Lyft. Being able to have people get from uh, uh, from their house to those probation appointments like, like Van talked about so that they won't be late. Uh, we actually developed a partnership with Talkspace. Talkspace is an online therapy, uh, therapy platform that is going to help not just people who are returning back to our communities, but those families as well giving those people the opportunities to decompress and talk about the trauma that, that, that they had you know, endured while they were incarcerated. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic. I, while I was ecstatic about the First Step Act, I'm just even more ecstatic about providing the appropriate resources that people need in order to be able to make you know, the, the, the contributions back to their families, never mind the communities, right? We want fathers to show up and be better. We want mothers to you know, have uh, 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 loving relationships with, with their children. That's, that's what we want at Cut 50. Obviously, yeah, we, we want to pass bills, but ultimately we want to be able to repair families. And every time we jump on the phone with a call with Van Jones, and every time we jump on a call with Jessica Jackson, every time we jump on a, phone, a call with anyone else in our team, we always keep people at the center of our conversations. So let's talk about the people a little bit more, Jessica. So I've, what I've seen of Cut 50's work is that you are really tackling the issue of the incarceration of women and the staggering increase in the incarceration of women and the conditions of confinement that you touched on previously. But what's some of the work that you're doing to try and spread that around the country to um, prevent that from occurring, from women being incarcerated, primary caregivers being incarcerated, and then the conditions of confinement that they have to face? Yeah, so I'm going to embarrass Erin Haney, our policy director, who <laughs> hates to be called out. Erin, wave your hand. Everybody can see you. So Erin and Ashley, who is sitting next to her, um, our, our empathy ambassador here, or dignity ambassador here in California, are working right now on a bill here in California, SB 394, uh, the Primary Caretaker Act, that will divert parents from even going into the system. 
uh, even getting a criminal record at all because it's before you even enter a plea. And we're hoping to take that around the country the same way we have with our uh, Dignity for Incarcerated Women bill. And I, I should say, you know, there are people in this room who have been really helpful with that campaign. I see Alyssa sitting in the front. She was willing to put on a t-shirt for us that said Dignity for Incarcerated yeah. Women. Um, we've got Christina Arquette here, who I, I know is friends with a bunch of you. Huge ambassador for our Dignity campaign, helped pull a bunch of people in and, and get some eyes on that. So really grateful. That's one uh, area that shows how you can really amplify um, the work that we're doing uh, on, on our campaigns. But, you know, this is an issue that really deeply impacts women. Uh, the women's population has gone up by over 700% in the last few decades. Um, and that is, you know, not just women. 80% of those are mothers, right? So that's kids that are being impacted uh, by this issue as well. Communities that are being impacted by this issue. And the truth is our prisons were not built for women. Their policies aren't women friendly. You have male guards standing there uh, wearing you know, guns, watching women naked in the showers. Um, and by the way, 86% of the women in prison self-report that uh, they have been sexually assaulted prior to coming to prison, right? So that's just trauma on top of trauma. Um, you've got, you know, women, like I said, being shackled during labor or while they're pregnant. We actually had a woman, uh, our Georgia Dignity Ambassador, Pamela Wynn, who tripped over her shackles at 20 weeks pregnant and lost her baby uh, because of it. And, um, you know, Pamela was essential to passing the First Step Act and getting that provision in there. You've got women who are being denied hygiene items, their monthly sanitary items, while in prison. And we've been able to make some, some changes to that, but now it's time to really think about women and parents and why we're, ch why we're sentencing people uh, to prison at all. And then I also want to say um, that there's another way that this issue impacts women, and that is you know, the wives and the girlfriends of people who are inside. And, uh, oh God, I'm going to get emotional. I said I wouldn't cry. but. Uh, to me, that's very, very uh, near and dear to my heart because um, I spent all day thinking about um, 15 years ago tomorrow, which is the anniversary of my husband going to prison. And, you know, I remember this night, 15 years ago, I remember laying in bed and we had a two month old daughter, so I wasn't sleeping much anyway, but laying in bed next to him and knowing we had court the next morning and knowing, you know, I didn't have a job. I was 22 years old, I had my GED. I was planning to be a housewife and he got arrested for his addiction. And I remember laying there and just being terrified of what was going to happen the next morning. I had never talked to our public defender before. Um, I didn't know what happened in court. You know, I, I was hopeful that maybe they would get him into rehab or something. But I think by that point in the process, I knew that we might be looking at prison time. I didn't have a job. We had a house. We had a mortgage. Um, I really didn't know. I remember laying there and, and wondering if I was going to be able to do it or if I should put my daughter up for, to somebody in the family to adopt, not knowing what was going to happen to us. And it was so devastating, just as a woman whose husband was going to prison. And now we have all these moms and all these dads who are in prison, and it doesn't just hurt them, it hurts their whole family. I'm so sorry to hear about what you had to, to face and how terrifying that whole situation was, not knowing who to turn to or, or what was even happening in that system. Um, what are some of the other ways in which you've been able to relate to people that you're working with to, to push this work forward and hearing stories from people who might be in similar situations to you? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most powerful things about my experience for myself was, um, you know, after I watched him, 
in the courtroom, and it's so weird if you've not been in a courtroom, you don't really know what to expect, but they called his name and he took a plea, um, 15 served six, and 15 years, 15 years and he, he served three and a half of those years. Um, and he turned around and he was kind of like, okay, here's my wallet and my wedding ring and my phone and like, here you go, right? Only time he ever handed me his phone, but. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he handed all that stuff to me and I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm holding a, our two month old daughter. And I remember, I, I looked around, I didn't know anybody in the courtroom, and the public defender was off for his next case, and so I just took my daughter, and she was hungry, and I took her into the bathroom, and I started to nurse her in one of the stalls, and I just remember bawling. I remember just covering her in tears, because I, I didn't know what was gonna happen. And then, after that moment, you know, I went home, and I started to try and figure out what I was gonna do next. I ended up coming out to visit my mom in California for a month, and it was there that I decided, like, I, I wasn't just gonna take this and, you know, work a minimum wage or whatever. I, I was gonna fight back, and that's when I decided to become a public defender. But on the next seven years of that journey, I didn't tell anybody that my husband was in prison. Mm. I was so embarrassed. I didn't even tell law school that my husband was in prison. You would think maybe I would have thought like, oh, okay, hey, I wanna come to this school because I wanna be a public defender because my husband's in prison. But I thought they wouldn't let me in. I thought it completely discredited me. And that's just me as the wife of somebody in prison. So this is an issue where there's so much stigma, so much embarrassment that we can't even talk about it. And if you can't talk, you can't talk about it, you can't address it. So when I finally met Van uh, six years ago I, and told Van my story, you know, Van was the one who was like, we gotta put this out there because if you feel this way, and by that time, you know, I'd run for city, or I was running for city council and I was really involved in the community, I was a lawyer. They said, if you feel that way, imagine how many other people are suffering in silence mm. and isolated. So at Cut 50, that's always been a huge part of our work. You know, not just telling the stories of people who are impacted, but giving them a platform. The Lewises, the Michael Mendozas, the Shakas, you know, giving them a platform, Ashley, to come to the table and not just tell their story, but also be a part of the solution. Lewis, I see you really nodding your head and getting emotional. Do you want to share anything about that, that stigma? <laughs> <laughs> You can have my they also share Kleenex. <laughs> you can have my snotty rag. rag. We're we a family at Cut 50, that's what we do. <laughs> um, yeah, so when we, were in, when we were in those offices in Congress, you would be surprised how conversation unlocks understanding. And we had conversations just like this with elected officials who couldn't disclose, disclose publicly that they had an individual that they were close to who had been impacted by the criminal justice system. And they had to sneak, you know, a one unnamed senator in particular, he pulled me to the side when we left his office and he said, he said every month, he said, I have a nephew that's incarcerated. And he said, every month I send my nephew $250. And he said, I send it anonymously. He said, because I don't want the press to know that I'm supporting someone who is incarcerated. So when Jessica talks about the stigma and she talks about these stereotypes, you know, I, I just wanna pause for a second and bring my sister Topeka K. Sam in the room and just ask a question because this is something that she usually does. By a show of hands, how many people in here know someone who has been formally incarcerated or convicted? And if you look around, you'll see that this is a conversation that we're not having with one another. We're not having with one another. So, um, you know, what Jessica said, it, it, it resonates with me because when I, when I left, I had, I had six children. I had six children. And I left the, the mother of my children with, without, you know, appropriate resources, without the appropriate support, so on and so forth. It wasn't until last year that, you know, like we talked uh, uh, earlier with the students, it wasn't until last year that I stopped taking a shower in my boxers. 
Because when you are incarcerated, one of the things that you have to do, I see some people nodding their head, one of the things that you have to do when you're incarcerated is to make sure that your safety is, is you know, intact at all times. So, you know, what Jessica said, it just reminded me. It reminded me of not just what I went through, but it also reminded me of what my family went through while I was away as well. Thank you both for, you. for sharing your personal experiences. I know over the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of people, um, artists, athletes, people with influence, uplifting the stories of folks who have been impacted by this carceral system. And Van, I'm wondering if you can tell this room who's all here to figure out how they can make a difference what you've seen to be the most impactful um, from people with influence on this issue? Well, I mean, you know, uh, you know, Isaiah came with us to the White House, uh, and that was huge. Uh, by the way, Isaiah's right there. Give Isaiah a round of applause. He took a lot of uh, abuse um, for doing that. Um, and people have to make their own decisions about what they, what they think that their base or their brand can, can withstand, but um, it's unreal how much uh, power people in this room have. The people you've worked with, the products you've worked on, uh, the, the, the movies you've been in, the, the people that you know, your name. You know, when you're talking to lawmakers, these are folks who, um, you know, when they come home at night, they cut on TV. When they come home at night, they're looking, you know, on Instagram at influencers. When they come home at, uh, on the weekend, if they, if they take any time on the weekend, they're going to movies like everybody else. And then they get up and they go and they sit uh, in, you know, low, smelly offices, they don't make a lot of money, and for somebody to walk in who they can tell their cousins and their ex-girlfriend from college, look at this selfie, <laughs> you know, that's a big deal. That's real for real currency that we have found can really move people. The reality is, look, I, I work for President Obama. When you're in those buildings, you are basically a piñata for everybody who's trying to get your boss to do something or stop doing something. And it just becomes white noise. So when somebody who is a prominent person, who's a beloved person, wants to come in and talk to you, that can make your whole day. And you don't even care what the issue is. You're going to move that person to the top of the list. And so, and people think, well, you know, I'm not whatever, you know, Beyonce or whatever these different people, be, that, that's, that's not even what I'm talking about. Just people who are part of this industry have tremendous influence. And uh, I would say, you know, if you can't physically come and walk those halls, though I think that you should, you'll learn a lot. And you, 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 you'll, you'll meet some characters that will help you as an actor. <laughs> Trust me. Trust me, there's way, way more characters in Washington, D.C. than in, in this town. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, you'll, you'll learn a lot, you'll, you'll see a lot, you'll, you'll get a lot, you'll be enriched by it. Um, but if you can't do it physically, um, you know, there's, there's video uh, things you can be a part of. Your name means a lot, money means a lot. Um, but I have to say, you know, there weren't that many African Americans who were willing to walk in that building last year. You had 200,000 people who were incarcerated, who were, Donald Trump had them in the palm of his hand. What's your name, young man? You. Isaiah. Isaiah, and what's your name? Tommy. I'm talking to you, Isaiah and Tommy. Donald Trump had 200,000 human beings in the palm of his hand. And by law, he could crush them all, or he could pardon them all and let them go. And he's crazy enough to do either one. <laughs> By his own admission. <laughs> so somebody had to go in there and make the case. 
Somebody had to go in there and make the case. And you go down the line of all the African American leaders and all the African American entertainers and celebrities who were willing to go in there when it was Obama, who were standing in lines to go in there when it was Obama, because they care about the community. Mm. 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 But when it was Obama, they were standing in line. Now they don't know, I'm not coming. Shoot. Twitter might get me. Black Twitter might get me. <laughs> now, I'm going to be very honest. Uh, there's no such thing as black Twitter. <laughs> there is white Twitter <laughs> that black people use, but that's not the same thing. So I'm not scared of black Twitter. It doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> But a lot of people are. <laughs> and we called Isaiah. We said, look, somebody, it can't just be little Dan Jones from CNN. Somebody with some clouds got to walk in this building. And Isaiah came. Isaiah came. And, um, and, and, and he made the case. And, and he, he, he got Jared off in the corner. I don't know what he told Jared. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you said reparations. Uh, I don't know what they were talking about, but I tell you, we didn't get reparations. We got first steps. So I, thank you, thank you, Isaiah. That's all I got. For. Thank you. Uh, and and now what I hope is that um, uh, it's easier for other people to do other things. You don't have to go talk to Donald Trump, but think about if that is too hard. Uh, what about Gavin Newsom, who's the governor in this state? Uh, who needs to hear from people? Uh, what about mayors? What about employers? What about your talent agencies? What about your law firm? You giving all this money to these lawyers? Are they giving pro bono to help? There's so much you can do, and I hope that you will. Jessica and Lewis a similar question um, but Jessica I might ask you this one because I realize I skipped this question um, <laughs> which is uh, we have a huge presidential election coming up next year um, Lewis also mentioned um, prosecutors holding all the power we have in LA County a big district attorney race happening next year um, People in this room who want to just be involved and be informed and know who to vote for, what should they look for in both a presidential candidate and also prosecu prosecutorial candidates around the country? Um, what should they be looking for for them to save, for them to commit to? And how can, how can people in this room get involved at that level? Well, I'll, I'll just speak to what you, can, what you should look for on criminal justice, yeah. and I think we have to make a fundamental shift in this country. We can't just keep locking people up. We need to actually start building up infrastructures to support people. So if you're looking at your local race, and, and I've served in local government, I was in, on the city council for six years, I was mayor of my town for a year, I know how hard it can be, but you gotta look for somebody who's going to build a you know, rehab facility, build somewhere that people can come get you know, substance abuse treatment. People can walk in with addiction and, and get the help they need. You've gotta build facilities that will help address mental health issues. Um, you've got to build facilities that will train people to have jobs. Uh, we've got a program at DreamCorps, our parent organization, uh, of Cut50 called Yes We Code, where they're teaching youth how to code, right? Computer coding. I don't know how to do it, but I'm glad they're teaching the youth how to do it um, because that get, opens up the doors for them into Silicon Valley, right? So you've got to invest in lo local infrastructure. You've got to vote for people who are going to divert as many people away from the prison system and instead use those resources locally. On the presidential level, look, there's a lot coming out on this issue. There's a new plan every day. And I gotta say, that is so exciting to me. Um, I remember when Van and I sat down and we were creating Cut50 and we were trying to talk about like what do metrics of success look like. And I remember Van saying, for him, success was gonna be when we had a 
stage full of candidates for the presidential election competing as to who was gonna you know, have the plan to let the most people out of prison or keep the most people from going there. And I think this election, we're actually gonna see that. Even Donald Trump, right? Like he's competing saying he's passed the First Step Act and he wants to do more. So I think we're in a positive place. I, I would encourage everybody to really consider this issue. There are a lot of important issues out there, but we really gotta address this issue both locally as well as federally. And the, the last thing I'll say about elections, most people don't know this, but if you wanna get involved and use your platform locally, a lot of people don't even vote for the DAs or the sheriff's races, which to me is really scary, right? Like in my county, Marin County, one of the most educated counties in the country, just like you know LA, we've got a lot of smart people, um, only 40% of the people who come to the polls and vote, vote in the DA's race. Like you're voting for the guy who can lock, uh, or girl, who can lock up communities mm -hmm. in your county, right? And you're not even gonna vote. Like you're there, you have the pen in your hand or the, you know, the staple, whatever it might be, and you're not even gonna vote. So that, right there, that's a way that people can plug in is just by raising awareness of how important that race is, raising awareness for candidates, you know, coming to a candidate's forum, offer to moderate a candidate's forum, start tweeting, start Instagramming, all that cool stuff for your local candidates for DA. Thank you. And I'll make a plug for one <laughs> that's already <laughs> happening that everyone can attend on October 15th. The League of Women Voters is doing one for LA County at the Pico Union around the power of the prosecutor and what's upcoming and how to get involved. So stay tuned for that from UCLA and the League of Women Voters. Um, Lewis, how do we continue, um, how do people in this room continue to change the hearts and minds? Because I think that's what this is really about, is people viewing this whole issue from a different perspective, not from a punitive perspective, but from one of healing uh, and transformation. Yeah, so uh, in, 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 in one of the compartments of Van's brilliance a few years back, he came up with a concept called the Empathy Network. And the Empathy Network is a coalition of about approximately 3,000 people that we have at large nationwide, a bipartisan coalition of the sort, where who are in the community, who are our, our eyes and ears, who are artists, athletes, influencers, advocates, everybody that you, dog catchers, right? <laughs> Any, anybody anybody whom, by whom you can think of who is impacted and want to do something, they are part of our Empathy Network. Uh, short of Jessica running for 20, in 2020, <laughs> I'll stay away from the. First. <laughs> I'll stay away from the political question, but <laughs> but uh, uh, we we want everyone in this room to be a part of the Empathy Network. We want you guys to be a part of the Cut 50 family. We want you guys to be a part of the coalition of people. Uh, that is going to not just be in this moment, but we want to create a movement. We want people to take this moment and we want to translate it into a movement. So how do we do that? How do we do that? First and foremost, all of us have something that it took me a long time to navigate when I was released from federal prison called a smartphone. When I went in, they had beepers. When I came home, <laughs> you, you got to be older than 35 <laughs> to know what a beeper is. Uh, was, <laughs> so all of you guys have smartphones. And I'm going to ask you to do something uh, with your phones. I'm going to ask you right now to pull out your phones. Everyone pull out your telephones. Pull out your telephones. All right. You are not going to take a selfie and you're not going to take a picture of Van Jones. What you are going to, <laughs> what you are going to do is you are going to text the, text the word freedom, freedom to 97483. Text the word freedom to 974. 83 freedom f r e e d o m to 97483 Okay, <laughs> Instagram, if you're watching this and if you wanna be a part of the Cut 50 family, you wanna be a part of our Empathy Network, uh, a coalition of more than 3,000 people at large nationwide, a sub-coalition of more than 300 organizations. We have approximately 70 organizers in virtually all 50 states. You can text the word freedom, freedom, F-R-E-E-D-O-M to 974 
9-7483. Text the word freedom to 9-7483. You will receive something immediately, uh, uh, an immediate response. Okay. You f- <laughs> Even Van did it. You will receive immediate response and once you fill that out, you will become part of the Cut 50 family. You will be part of the Dream Core family and overall you will be part of our Empathy Network. I didn't even know we did this. <laughs> <laughs> it's new every day. I'm, I'm just going to piggyback on that. Um, we have an incredible day of action. Some of you guys have been involved in it. It's the Day of Empathy. It's yes. the first Tuesday in March. Um, some of you have been as involved as coming with us. We go out into all the states, uh, as Lewis was saying. We had David Arquette and Christina Arquette last um, March freezing with me and Aaron over in Little Rock, Arkansas, standing on the steps. <laughs> But you know what, their presence made a huge difference. For example, um, apparently David is known for some movie he was in, something about a screaming, something, scream, something. (laughs) So um, we were walking by the governor's office and literally been trying to get a meeting with the governor of Arkansas to talk about bringing legislation there. David just like opens the door and walks in and they're like, oh my God, well, go get the governor, right? <laughs> and then, you know, the governor, the governor got his selfie and everything, but um, <laughs> the governor got his selfie and everything, but we were able to sit there and have like a good 20 minute conversation about the prison population in his state and what needed to happen. And now we're well on our way to First Step Act, Arkansas 2021. So um, you as... You as artists and athletes have a huge platform. I know Alyssa and um, Weldon Angelos, who's in here somewhere, as well, and whose name should probably be up here because I swear, <laughs> happy you are here for him. Um, Danny, you guys have all made incredible videos for Day of Empathy yes. before. If you can't get out to some remote state with us, um, you could come here in California, or you can make a video and celebrate the uh, Day of Empathy and just raise more awareness of the Empathy Network. I also want to add as well, uh, because our comms team would kill me if I did not add this. Okay. I, <laughs> I want to ask all of you guys, if you want to stay more connected uh, with the issue, if you want to follow us in real time to hear what's going on, please go on Twitter and follow us at Cut50. Alex, is that right? Cut underscore 50 or is it Cut 50? Cut underscore 50. Cut underscore 50. You can follow Cut 50. You can follow Van Jones 68 on uh, on Twitter and you will get real time information, a real time commentary on what is going on, how we are doing things and what it is that we have going on. Thank you. So do we have any uh, index cards from questions from the audience that we've collected? Yes. No. Anyone? Oh. We'll, we'll go up here. We, ha- we have about, I think, 10 minutes to, to ask questions. I think one of the things that... Uh, Got a mic for you. One of the things that we have to consider is that no matter who we elect as a prosecutor, his job is to get convictions. There are no prosecutors that will say, oh, no, I think he's innocent. His job is to make sure that anybody that comes in front of him is prosecuted. And since the three strike law, we have completely taken the power away from the judge and given it to the prosecutor. So until we change that, doesn't matter who you vote in. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. I'm, I'm going to jump in and say that's a very, very valid point, and I'm really excited. Um, you guys hear it first, but Cut 50's next big issue on the federal level is prosecutors. Um, at this point, you know, we have a system where a prosecutor can commit an unethical behavior in federal court and not lose their license in a also state, in court. state court. Yeah, and, and not lose their license in state court. Um, you have prosecutors who, do, you know, judges who don't even have a way of enforcing that prosecutors turn over information to the defense that shows that their client is innocent. Um, you've got prosecutors who use jailhouse informants and don't have to even talk to the jury about the fact that this person has a um, leverage point, right? They're getting a deal for it. So. We're really excited. Uh, The first of our prosecutor federal bills has come out. It's the Due Process Protection Act. 
Uh, we've got some other bills coming out. So yes, we need to not just get good people into office, like a Larry Krasner, but we need to also change the laws and, and even out those scales of justice. And one of the questions I got in the card that I'm going to kind of fold into that is around what can you encourage prosecutors or local actors to do to be involved in more preventive or rehabilitative efforts versus that sort of punitive prosecutorial role? Is there something that you all feel like can be done at that level? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about the human impact again. Like, if you think about the experience that a prosecutor has, they're only really talking to law enforcement and victims, right? And it's important to talk to victims. It's also important to talk to the other side, many of whom are also victims of a crime. So I think making sure that we're bringing those stories in there and that they're getting out of their offices. I guess Van called them like smelly little offices, but they're getting <laughs> out of their offices um, and, and into the community. So you want somebody who's actively looking for diversion programs and, and getting involved in the community. And Van, do you want to talk at all about your work that you've been doing with victims and um, folding them into the criminal justice reform movement? You know, we got saved in the end. Uh, we went into the Senate with the First Step Act, and we were, we were hopeful. I mean, we had Trump support, et cetera, but there were still some holdouts who wanted to destroy us. And one of them, one of them was a guy named Tom Cotton, and he's a terrible human being. Um, and, you know, like, I'm Mr. Like, love and forgiveness. This dude is a horrible person. And he decided that he was going to ruin us in the Senate and prevent us from getting this bill done. And, but he made a mistake. He, uh, he self-appointed, I'm going to defend the victims of the crimes, and I'm going to make sure that if the First Step Act passes, I'm going to put a poison pill in the bill that you have to notify anybody who comes out from based on First Step, the federal government has to notify their victims because that's going to make sure that you know, people know how many, all this crazy stuff. And, but you had you know, this very loud noise coming from Capitol Hill, which was the knees knocking of lawmakers afraid they were going to be seen as anti-victim. They were going to have to vote against a pro-victim's rights amendment on the floor of the Senate. That is not something you, wanted to, well, you want to do ordinarily. You don't want to be in that situation, because that can be an ad. You know, this person doesn't care about crime victims. And so you literally heard, like, knees knocking. But what they didn't understand was, we've been doing this for a long time. And a young woman named Lenore Anderson, who had been my intern in like 98, um, and had worked for me at the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights uh, in the early 2000s, had gone on to better things. And she had built an organization that had organized 30,000 crime victims who were themselves saying, we need change. We're getting, you know, this is not helping us, just putting people away for a thousand years and you know, they come back worse or their, their kids are running around crazy, this is not working. So she had 30,000 crime victims that he didn't know anything about because he was talking about people he wasn't talking to. Mm. And whenever you talk about people you don't talk to, you're gonna make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And so he walked out there and opened his big mouth and talked and talked and talked and talked. And when, when he got finished, Dick Durbin, Sauntered on up there, <laughs> just slow and smiling, and then read the statement from 30,000 crime victims that said, we don't want the government to forcibly notify us about some of this stuff under the existing Bill of Rights for, for victims. You can be notified, or you can choose not to, because some people don't want to have to revisit that. Mm -hmm. And he was taking their rights away. And they said he was wrong for doing that. And we beat his butt 87 to 12. <laughs> so 80, 80, 88 if Lindsey Graham would have got off the and plane. And if Lindsey Graham had got his butt off the plane, like I said, it would have been 88. So, so this comes down to human stuff. Please don't think that, that this stuff happens automatically. We could have gotten beat on the floor that day, right? The ambush, right? The last minute. But we had somebody we could call on. We want to be able to call on you. You have no idea who you can help. If, if you would have walked down the hall in 50 states out of 50, 
You could get us a meeting with no appointment just because so, your face is so visible. Everybody knows you. Don't underestimate your ability to help this team do well. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's time. You know, it's time. So you all have talked about diversion and, and how many more questions we got? Oh, well, <laughs> I was told we could go all night. So. <laughs> Let's do two more is, questions. Is I, got, I got a pee, man. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take a break and come back? I'm biffy, huh? <laughs> 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 two more questions. Okay, two more questions. We'll, okay. we'll take two more. <laughs> oh my god. Well, look at this. <laughs> I got one more. Um, we'll just read the questions and we'll figure out which ones we want. They are kind of hard to read. Um, all right. Okay. Um, we'll take this one. In what ways do you think the cannabis industry and all the money com coming from taxes and legalization can be used to support criminal justice reform? That's a great question. I'm a <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. I'll, I'll, look, I'll, I'll speak to it. Look, I'm, I'm a super nerd. I've never, had a, I've never had a sip of alcohol. I've never had a beer. I've never had a sip of wine. I've never smoked a marijuana cigarette or any kind of cigarette. So. Well, I can. <laughs> That's pretty evident. So, <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, really, I really am. I'm serious. Uh, so, uh, what I can say <laughs> is, late. We get tired. <laughs> we get silly. So, so I, I can say, you know, I'm 100% against uh, drugs, and I'm 100% against the drug war. Uh, people shouldn't be, be put in prison because of those kind of choices. And now that you have all these people in prison uh, for that, everybody who's in prison for any kind of thing based on marijuana should come home with a clean record. They should be allowed to be a part of this industry. And the money from that industry should be put into the taxes or whatever, should be designated to help the communities that have been devastated by the drug war. You can be as anti-drug as I am and be anti-drug war, and that's what it's going to take. Do y'all two want to weigh in on the marijuana cigarette? What he text? said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since, since I think we're, we want to wrap things up, I'm just going to go down the row. Final thoughts for this audience. Oh, was there any more good questions? Oh. I, I didn't mean to mess up y'all's <laughs> y'all's questions. Just read the questions so we can see okay, the brilliance okay. of the crowd, right, okay. and then we'll wrap up. Okay, all right. Uh, so let's talk about incorporating the formerly incarcerated into the entertainment industry and how... Yes and how economic to financial justice is over, economic and financial justice is often overlooked. Suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything being done to counter the political power and money from police unions? Very good question. Oh, I thought we were answering. No, we're just no, no, reading we'll, 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 we'll answer the ones okay. we want you. All right, how do we elect more <laughs> progressive judges? Um, I asked that one already, okay. And then, along with continuing the efforts of releasing folks from harsh sentences, what is currently being done to create humane conditions for those who are currently housed in a penal institution? No. Yep. I summarized the other ones when I asked you. That's, good. That's the job of a moderator. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Um, you you want to go first? Yeah, what is being done uh, in order, what was it to make our, our penal institutions more humane? The conditions. Yeah, the conditions. Um, well, again, you know, through the First Step Act, one of the things that we did was we also prohibited the solitary confinement placement of juvenile offenders. If you understand anything about neurology, the, our brain doesn't fully develop until you're approximately 25 years old. So we just thought that it was absolutely absurd. Um, to have a juvenile offender that is going, you know, who doesn't even, who hasn't even fully developed through puberty, uh, to be placed in solitary confinement. Um, so, you know, obviously, with the brilliance of our our our, our policy director, uh, in in Jessica at our helm, we are always exploring possibilities and probabilities so that we can make not only our our criminal justice uh, system far much more. Uh, uh, robust in and through reform, but also to make our, our, our penal systems safer. 
Um, I'm going to jump on the police unions question because because that you. highlights kind of a broader issue of you know money and financial interests in the system. So yes, police unions, guard unions, you know these are folks who are worried about whether or not they're going to have their jobs, right? So they're spending a lot of money to keep people in prison. But you've also got other companies, and we hear a lot about private prisons. And of course, I think it's wrong to profit off of incarceration. But it's not just private prisons. It's also companies that are contracting with our state prisons. And I have literally walked into offices where lobbyists for Aramark or lobbyists for JPay or Global Tellink, the company that, by the way, when my husband was incarcerated and we're now divorced in large part because we had a hard time staying in contact when he was incarcerated. It cost me $21 to have a 15 minute phone call with him, right? Like I was a broke, single, basically single mom studying and I had to pay $21 to talk to him, right? That was a company called Global Tellink that was making all the money off of our family, all the money I didn't have off of our family just so we could have a conversation uh, once a week, right? So there are a lot of companies that are making a lot of money off of this. There are companies um, that are, you know, investing in private prisons or investing in the stock of these other companies. So I would say one important thing to do is wake up, do your research, don't give them your money, right? If you have money, which some of the folks in this room might because you guys do stuff on TV and stuff, but if you have <laughs> money, <laughs> Don't give it to people who are going to, you know, profit off of incarceration. So wake up and do the research on that. Um, and of course, donating to groups, you know, if you want to offset the damage that these dollars are doing, then donate to organizations that are doing work to pass reform. Such as Cut 50. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts from all the panelists? Um, I'll just say a couple, a couple things. Um, there are other people from Cut50 who are in the room. I see Alex back there who does a good job. Give Alex a round of applause, by the way. He works his butt off. He works his butt off. Um, uh, one, one, of my, one of my great, great heroes is here, also Michael Mendoza. Give Michael Mendoza a big round of applause. Uh, he's really. This dude, this dude is the truth, man. He, he, he came home from prison and he, I don't know how he does it, uh, but an unbelievable family member. But also, you know, people act like California is an easy place to make change, it's not. Uh, and Mendoza's been on his grind, making real positive changes here. I love this brother, uh, unbelievable guy. We also have the head of the Dream Corps uh, which is the mothership for Yes We Code and Cut 50 and all the other stuff. Uh, Nisha Anand is here. Where's Nisha? Nisha, raise your hand. So Nisha's right there. Um, so it, it really is, uh, you know, no pressure, no diamonds. No pressure, no diamonds. Uh, this is a tough fight. Prison is a tough place, but it's a lot of diamonds being created, man. It's a lot of beautiful, extraordinary people who should never have to go through what they're going through, but they're turning breakdowns into breakthroughs every day. And I have been blessed. I, I, I've been in, in jailhouses, uh, and I've been in now two different White Houses. And I'll tell you this, the smartest people at, say, San Quentin are as smart as the smartest people in the Obama or Trump administrations. I mean, the smartest people in those places are, are smart. There's, um, but the wisest people that I met in prison are wiser than anybody in Washington, D.C. And we need to get folks, I'm, I'm not saying that for applause, it's just the truth. The wisest people I've met in prison are wiser than anybody in Washington, D.C. And we need our folks home. Yeah. We need our folks home. Uh, we need people to be able to come home and do well. We need people to be able to come home and have a springboard to success and not a trapdoor back into failure. And this is simple stuff, man. 
You know, everybody counts, everybody matters, everybody makes mistakes, we need each other. And we're wasting a lot of genius, we're wasting a lot of time, and the people in this room have the ability to make a difference in this fight. Uh, and there's something about making a difference, especially when it's across these racial lines, and these political lines, and all these lines that they say we can't cross, and we cross them, and we have people coming home, it becomes addictive. And if you take a dress, when you zip it, you zip it from the bottom to the top. And everybody wants to kind of fix the problems up here and you know, how can we get the Congress people working? How can we get all the elites working? How can we get Silicon Valley doing right? It's not gonna come that way. They're gonna keep fighting and acting crazy. It's gonna be from the bottom up. It's gonna be from the bottom up because the, the genius and the diamonds and the wisdom and the creativity and the resilience and the grit is at the bottom. That's true in Appalachia, that's true in the hood, that's true with the border, that's true on Native American reservations. The genius, the beauty of this country is at the bottom. And as we engage there, and we pull people together there, we can zip the whole thing back up. And so it's not just people behind bars who need to get free. None of us are free. All of us are trapped in fear, trapped in division, trapped in these cell phones that are driving us crazy, trapped in you know, uh, less than what it should be. And so I am very, very proud to be a part of Cut 50. I'm very proud to get a chance to work with Lewis. Very, very proud to get a chance to work with Topeka and Jessica and Aaron and the whole group because it makes me a better person. Uh, I get more out of it than they do and I'm just proud to be here, so thank you. All right. Looks Ladies and like gentlemen, let's thank our moderator, Alicia Varani. Van Jones, Jessica Jackson, and Lewis L. Reed. They're going to be available to talk to you at the end, so thank you so much for coming to our event tonight. Hopefully you got something out of it. We want you to use your voices to help the issues you're passionate about. So thank you for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Artists and Athletes event. Thank you so much. <laughs>